Hello, and welcome to ONET Academy. This previously recorded webinar is part of the ONET Academy webinar series, a set of online training presentations. This webinar recording, an ONET Academy briefing, staying current, a behind-the-scenes look at the ONET data collection process, will start momentarily. Uh, with that, I want to turn things over to our presenter, Dr. Janet Wall. Janet? Gary, thanks an awful lot, and welcome to all of you um, on this particular webinar, taking a look at uh, how data is collected uh, for the ONET system. I see uh, by your um, input that there are a number of you from the state of Michigan and North Dakota and um, other places that, and Detroit. Here, here's a uh, person from Detroit. Um, you're probably having the same kind of weather that we are here in the D.C. area. Um, it's about one to three inches of snow accumulation, and right now it is just beautiful looking outdoors, uh, but in a while I'm sure it's going to be all slushy and, and difficult for travel. So I'm glad to uh, have all of you uh, with me today in this presentation. And um, a little bit about myself, I'm Janet Wall. And I'm an independent consultant and have been uh, for about, um, about 10 years now. Um, my areas of interest are assessment and career development, uh, program evaluation. And I do enjoy very much um, my work with Mayor and Mayor on the development and delivery of uh, webinars related to ONET. Uh, for today, uh, I have uh, several objectives that I would like for us to accomplish. And uh, that's basically to take a look at the ONET content model and look at uh, specifically the data elements uh, within that model and to show you uh, how data are collected to support the structure of that model and uh, how the uh, database for ONET and ONET Online is, uh, is updated and what that schedule is. So with that in mind, um, I want to start out with the ONET content model. And, um, as you can see in the top section of this model, we have the various blocks there that indicate um, information structure related to the workers. So we have worker characteristics, we have worker requirements, and we have experience requirements of the worker. And down on the bottom, the, the bottom three blocks are um, characteristics related to occupation. And so we have occupational requirements, workforce characteristics, and occupation-specific information. If you take a look at the two blocks on the left, um, those really are uh, common to most occupations. So they're cross-occupational characteristics. If you take a look at the boxes to the right, you see that it's a very specific information that would be different depending upon the occupation we're, we're looking at or we're collecting information on. So it's very occupation specific. And so as a result, the data collection mechanism uh, really relates to those particular areas. And so what I'd like to do now is to look at in a little more detail each of these blocks. And as we do that, uh, think about the times you have spent on ONET Online or looked at the ONET database, and you'll be able to see how um, the, the structure here really tracks to what you have been seeing on ONET Online. So let's take a look first at worker characteristics. And so worker characteristics uh, can be broken out into such areas as ability, occupational interest, work values, and work styles. And each of those areas are defined in this particular ONES structure. So uh, abilities, for example, are defined as enduring attributes of the individual that influence performance. And, and you can see the uh, definitions of those other sub-characteristics in the worker characteristics block. Worker requirements also has more detail. And that, those sub-areas are basic skills, cross-functional skills, knowledge, and education. Then we have experience requirements. And that is subdivided into experience and training, basic skills entry requirements, 
cross-functional skills entry requirements, and licensing. Now, taking a look at the occupation requirement, we see that that is also subdivided into generalized work activities, detailed work activities, organizational context, and work context. Then under workforce characteristics, we have labor market information and occupational outlook. And last, we have the occupation specific information, which includes tasks and tools and technology. And as you are uh, probably aware, uh, especially if you've come to one of the other webinars uh, dealing with tools and technology, these areas um, are being populated right now, the tools and technology area, for the in-demand occupations. This is uh, definitely an evolutionary uh, situation here with tools and technology. It's, it's growing. The amount of information on tools and technology is growing. Now, we kind of took a look at the sub-areas for each of the six areas of the ONET model, but I did want you to know also that it's even more detailed than that. So I want to show you that when we get to the basic skills area, that has additional detail to include reading comprehension, active listening, writing, speaking, math, and science. And it also has the process areas of critical thinking, active learning, learning strategies, and monitoring. And as we can see also, uh, there's cross-functional skills, there's the knowledge area, there's education. And I just wanted to show you one more portion of this, which is cross-functional skills. And that can be burst out or expanded into uh, social perceptiveness and the social skills areas, including uh, coordination and persuasion, negotiation, instructing, and service orientation. And then we have the complex problem-solving skills. And we have the technical skills, which are listed there also as operations analysis, technology design, equipment selection. And we have system skills. So all those areas, all those sub-areas within each of those blocks, he burst out or expanded into even more finer levels of information uh, that are collected about each of the ONET occupations. So uh, again, thinking about the times that you've gone to ONET online, and investigated in occupation, this is the kind of information that ONET Online provides for each of the occupations. Now, how did we get, uh, how do we populate all these areas and sub-areas with information that is useful that actually goes into ONET Online? Well, uh, let me take you a little bit through the process here. Uh, first, uh, the initial population of information about occupations came from the dictionary of occupational titles. And as you recall, um, that was information about around 12,000 occupations that uh, the information being produced by occupational analysts predominantly and um, really was not updated very frequently, uh, but it was the best information that was uh, out there and on a national level regarding occupations with the U.S. economy. So basically, they, uh, they had to drop down or consolidate those 12,000 occupations into um, a more a smaller taxonomy. And so the kind of the driving force for that uh, was the standard occupational classification, uh, which is the system that OMB mandates for um, agencies to collect information. And so there's sort of a linkage between um, the ONET occupations and the SOC levels. And so actually ONET has a few more uh, occupations than the SOC taxonomy has, uh, but basically it is SOC-based. And so once that um, information was aggregated into the SOC occupations, then they utilized the Dictionary of Occupational Titles information and did an initial population of information about those occupations. <clears throat> then the whole idea was, and the whole idea for ONET and putting things online was to be able to refresh that information periodically so it was more updated and more accurate information. And so um, they, they
today the people at DOL um, made a, a, a tremendous effort to go out and collect information from employees and from uh, occupational experts in order to get good information into the ONET system. So at this point in time, there are about 275 pieces of information on each of the ONET occupations. Now, it differs a little bit um, depending upon the occupation because it's still not fully updated. Um, but basically, they attempt to uh, update the number of occupations every year with the intent that uh, every five years, all of the occupations will have updated information. So it goes in stages. At this point, they actually have collected information for all 812 ONET occupations. The last few, are, um, the information is still being analyzed, and it's going to be incorporated into the ONET system very soon. So most of the occupations are, in fact, uh, updated with employee and occupational expert information with the um, uh, remaining uh, about uh, 500 or so, uh, I'm sorry, 100 or so occupations uh, still being looked at. They have been updating the ONET system about two times per year, and uh, they should have the completed information by June of 2008, which is not all that far from now. So in about six months, will have that full update of all 812 occupations. There are two ways the information gets incorporated. And one is in the development database, which you can obtain from onetcenter.org if you're interested. And uh, this information is out there for people who want to do some research on the occupations, but primarily for people who uh, have systems in the states or commercial systems that utilize ONET information. So it gives those people some amount of time to incorporate the new data into their own systems before it gets posted into what's called the production database, which is the online system. So it's that user-friendly uh, ONET online system that, that you probably use more than the uh, development database. So basically, three months after the first database is released, the ONET Online gets updated. All right, so how does the information get in, into the system? How is it collected? How is the information updated? Well, DOL does this uh, through a contract with um, uh, RTI, Research Triangle Institute, and they are actually the ones that collect the information from employees and from occupational experts. And it basically... Uh, is a two-stage system. Um, first, there is a random sample of the businesses out there uh, in the U.S. economy who are um, who, who we believe or people believe are actually employing the workers for the occupations that are being updated. So, for example, if the uh, if computer uh, operator is the occupation that is being targeted for update. They would take a look at the U.S. businesses and um, make a random selection of those businesses that are believed to actually utilize um, computer operators. Once that is done, then the second stage is to, to actually take a random sample of workers within the occupations and in those businesses that were randomly selected. Okay, so we have first the grouping of businesses, then second within those businesses, the employees are randomly selected. And then uh, they attempt to gather information from those individuals. And they do that through various questionnaires that have been developed and that actually do track to those various sub-areas that we saw in the ONET content model. You can actually download all of those questionnaires by going to um, uh, onetcenter.org and there's a, uh, a link there that you will, you will see, which is for data collection. And if you uh, go to that link, you can download and utilize all of those questionnaires. Um, Janet, I'm going to just remute everyone's line, and okay. we won't be. Um, I won't uh, allow them to have the ability to unmute until we get to the uh, to the end. Okay. Just give okay. me a second, all right? Sure. 
Would you like your participants to be able to unmute their own lines by pressing star six, press one for yes, and two for no? All participants have been muted. You will now rejoin the conference. Janet Sawyers. Okay, thank you very much, Gary. I appreciate it. Um, uh, just to, I'm sorry, one more, one more thing. Um, again, for the participants, uh, the phone lines have been muted. Um, if you hit star six, you will not be able to speak. So please use the chat feature to the lower left hand of your screen if you do have a question or a comment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. That uh, background music and, and noise was uh, a little bothersome, and I'm sure it was to uh, the other participants as well. All right, so again, you can download each of those questionnaires and use them yourself if you want. Um, and I, I think it would actually be a good idea for you to take a look at those questionnaires to see what kinds of items are on those questionnaires, um, just for your own information, if you're, if you're really interested in the um, structure and basis of the uh, ONET system. It's a, a good way to, to understand it better. So um, the questionnaires and, and the request for information are packaged in such a way that um, a worker does not have to take more than 30 minutes to complete the questionnaire. And you might ask, well, why is that? And they only get one questionnaire. They don't get all of the questionnaires. Well, it's a, you know, it's a, a time and resource burden for uh, employers. Um, the employers are, are gracious enough to, to actually give to DOL and to the federal government, really, um, time of their employees that the employee should be working for the company, but yet is, is now given the time to actually complete these questionnaires for the, for the Department of Labor. And so we want to reduce that burden to the extent possible while still getting good information and as accurate information and as current information as possible. So um, no, no employee gets more than one questionnaire, which is about 30 minutes of time. All right, the questionnaires are paper pencil, they're computerized, and they're also available in Spanish. Um, so, uh, again, it depends upon the employee and which way the employee wants to actually uh, complete the information. All right. I want to focus a little bit now on the actual questionnaires and some of the items. And basically, um, there are four major questionnaires, one on general work activities, one on skills, one on knowledge, and one on work context. So again, a worker would get one of the questionnaires, 30, 30 minutes of time, but occupational experts actually complete um, each of the questionnaires for a particular occupation. All right, so now we're going to focus on some of the items to give you a better feel for the kind of information that is collected and how it's collected. So here is um, the purpose of this particular slide is to really review the kinds of directions that are given to people to actually complete the items. So here is um, kind of a practice item in a sense, and it actually shows the individual how to mark the information and the response to the item. So for item A, the question says, how important is the activity to your current job? All right, and then further it says, how important is, and in, in capital letters, getting information to the performance of your current job? And the person would answer that on a one through five scale, from not important on the left to extremely important on the right. And the employee is shown that um, this particular example has marked very important by putting an X in that uh, oval. And then the B section, what level of activity is needed to perform your current job? And so the specific item then is what level of uh, caps getting information is needed to perform your current job? And that gets rated on a one through seven scale. And so in this particular instance, the individual has marked a five. Now, what is interesting about the way they have done this is they have provided, in order to help an individual more accurately answer the question, uh, there are what I call anchor points that have been defined. So if you look at that bottom question, you see that a person, if they uh, 
workers felt that their job required just a similar kind of level of getting information that is uh, similar to follow a standard blueprint, they would mark a two. If they thought that the level was less than that, they would mark a one. Presuming the person feels that the level of getting information is higher than a two, they would mark it somewhere three through seven. And so additional anchor points are given to help an individual kind of triangulate what that level is. So they would look at the next anchor point, review a budget, and if the level for their current job was higher than a two but lower than a four, they would mark it a three. Or if it was equivalent to a four, they would mark it four. Or if it was higher, then they would take a look at that next anchor point, which is study international tax laws, and make a determination as to whether or not the level for their current job was equal or greater or lesser than that last anchor point. So again, it gives people a little bit of, um, of guidance as to how they should mark the information. And I had a question come in from uh, Eileen. Eileen, thank you. Uh, what kind of person is an occupational expert? Uh, they would be uh, probably uh, people who are have worked in that field, uh, people who might be in a supervisory uh, capacity for uh, workers of the type for the occupation that's being looked at. Uh, they are uh, people who uh, do know something about occupations and occupational information. So it would be that general kind of, of individual. Uh, and, of course, it kind of differs depending upon the occupation that we're looking at. But in general, that would be um, that would be the answer. All right. So this is kind of the, the procedure that people would use to answer the questions. And as we mentioned, there are several questionnaires, and I want to show you some of the, the various items from each of the questionnaires. But generally, that is the set of directions that people are given to follow in order to actually complete the items. All right, so for that questionnaire, which is the general work activities questionnaire, there are actually 41 item pairs. And so here we have the first one, which is similar to the directions that I just got through describing how important is getting information to the performance of your current job, what level of getting information is needed to perform your current job. Here's another item from that questionnaire. How important is identifying objects, actions, and events to the performance of your current job? And what level of identifying objects, actions, and events is needed to perform your current job? And I have a question from um, I-K-N-A-S-E-L. It's nasal. Uh, can a person answer more than one question, questionnaire, if they wish? Uh, generally, the system is that uh, uh, a worker will only answer one questionnaire. Okay, are there tutorials and competency exams to ensure that the state staff are able to appropriately assign the correct ONET code to job seekers and, and job orders? Uh, my understanding is that uh, RTI, the contractor, actually works with the employers to make sure that um, the kind of information they are getting is, is the kind of information that they, they want. It's for the correct occupation and, um, and the correct ONET code. So it's not, uh, you know, these, these questionnaires are not just flung out there to, to people uh, with the hope of getting them answered. It, there's a very structured procedure that um, they go through in order to make sure that they're getting the right information. All right, so back to the items, and thank you for those questions. Uh, another item from that questionnaire, how important is monitoring processes, materials, or surroundings to the performance of your current job? So there's, again, the importance question. And then at what level of monitoring processes, materials, or uh, surroundings is needed to perform your current job? And again, um, one through seven scale anchor points to um, assist. All right, the skills questionnaire has 
35 items. And the first one there relates to reading comprehension. How important is reading comprehension to the performance of your current job? And what level of reading comprehension is needed to perform your current job? So again, uh, an item pair, one dealing with importance, one dealing with level. <clears throat> and a second item, how important is active listening to the performance of your current job? What level of active listening is needed to perform your current job? Item three deals with writing. How important is writing to the performance of the occupation? What level of writing is needed to perform the occupation? And so again, people answer these kinds of questions. The knowledge questionnaire deals with the first item is administration and management. How important is administration and management knowledge to the performance of your current job? What level of administration and management knowledge is needed to perform your current job? A second item, how important is clerical knowledge to the performance of your current job? What level of clerical knowledge is needed to perform your current job? A third item, how important is economics and accounting knowledge to the performance of the occupation? What level of economics and accounting knowledge is needed to perform the occupation? So again, I'm giving you just a, a, an idea of the kinds of items that will appear on these questionnaires, and I encourage you to actually take a look at the full questionnaire to, to get the um, more comprehensive feel of the kinds of things that are asked. Now we get to the work context and work styles questionnaires, which have uh, 54 items. And again, I'm just going to give you a flavor of the kinds of items that one might find on the work context questionnaire, work styles questionnaire. Um, how often does the current job require face-to-face -face discussions with individuals and within teams? And then you can see the descriptors for each of the uh, points there, one through five. How frequently does your current job require public speaking? How frequently does your current job require telephone conversation? A little more on the work context. How frequently does your current job require written letters and memos? How much contact with others by telephone, face-to-face, -face, or otherwise is required to perform your current job? How important are interactions that require you to work with or contribute to a work group or team to perform your current job? And some other items that you can find on the work context questionnaire uh, deal with uh, education level. So if someone were being hired to perform this job, indicate the level of education that would be required. And work style, um, again, a sampling. How important is cooperation to the performance of your current job? How important is concern for others? How important is social orientation? Now, there's uh, work tasks. And if you think about it, and as we also uh, described when we looked at that full content model for ONET, there are some things that are really specific to occupations. And so you can't have a questionnaire um, that contains all work tests for all occupations and expect the, um, even the um, occupational expert to wade through that list and pick out the ones that are relevant. So what they do in this instance is they actually tailor the information to each occupation. So it depends on the occupation now as to the kinds of, of questions that are asked. And I wanted to give you an example of what that would be like. So what happens is um, they go to the, the basically the job family and select it and ask to view the questionnaire. And in this instance, every employee in the sample completes the task questionnaire. All right, so here's uh, four uh, adult literacy, remedial education, and GED teachers and instructors. And this is the kind of um, set of items that a person
person would be able to complete for that particular occupation. So what we have here is the definition of that occupation. And then it, there will be a listing of the tasks that are related to that occupation. So for example, the first test that we see here is uh, conduct classes, workshops, and demonstrations to teach principles, techniques, and methods in subjects such as basic English language skills, life skills, and workforce entry skills. And what the person does is for their occupation that is uh, not relevant, that task is not relevant, and they're asked then if it is relevant to actually rate the frequency and importance of that particular task. So if they uh, do the task more than once per month, they would fill out the bubble under three. If they do it hourly or more often, they would complete or click on that little bubble area for number seven. Then they would actually mark the importance level for that particular task. And so it's not important, somewhat important, important, very important, or extremely important. All right, that's for the first task. Then they would go on to the second task, which is instruct students individually and in groups using various teaching methods such as lectures, discussions, and demonstrations. And again, mark it as not relevant. If it's relevant, to go ahead and indicate the frequency with which it is done in that occupation, and also the importance level. And it's not just two tests, it's actually much more. And the list is longer for some occupations, not as long for others, it just depends. Remember, it's occupation specific in this instance. And so another task would be assign and grade classwork and homework, adapt teaching methods and instructional materials to meet students' varying needs, abilities, and interests, and so on the, with the rest of the list. And they would do this in terms of um, it's relevant or not, uh, frequency, and importance for each of those tasks. Let's take a look at another occupation. To, and the point here is to show you that the tasks are, actually are different. So we're going to pick air traffic controllers. All right, here again, the definition of the occupation. And the first task is organize flight plans and traffic management plans to prepare for planes about to enter assigned airspace. One would hope that for an air traffic controller that would be a relevant task. And then frequency is indicated and the importance level is determined. Second task, provide flight path changes or directions to emergency landing fields for pilots traveling in bad weather or in emergency situations. They must not relevant, frequent, or if it's relevant, frequency and importance. And the list continues with some additional tasks, such as compile information about flights from flight plans, pilot reports, radar, and observations. And you can see the other tasks that are part of a laundry list for air traffic controllers. And again, I'm just showing you a sample. You can go to ONET Center and actually take a look at all of the work tests for the occupation. All right, so that information then is collected up, it is analyzed, and as I mentioned, it uh, first gets put into the production, uh, um, it first gets put into the database and then three months later gets put into ONET online. And here is the schedule that has been generally followed for updating the information. And so you can see the number of occupations that have been included and the cumulative total of occupations. And so as I mentioned, all occupations uh, should have been updated and information incorporated by uh, June of 08. But they're going to continue updating information. Again, the goal is to update all the information for all the occupations over a five-year period. There's also some additional information that they primarily um, gather from websites and from other techniques that they utilize. And the techniques uh, 
uh, we describe in more detail in the webinar that we do on tools and technology. So basically, they go to websites and determine the kinds of tools and technologies that are being used by people who work in those occupations. Oh, and I failed to mention that with regard to the various uh, work tasks, that if an employee determines that there is a work task that is missing from the list, they get to add the task and uh, rate its frequency and, and level. So this is another way that uh, the system can get updated by people who are actually on the ground working in that occupation. So it, it's uh, t attempting to incorporate the best information possible uh, about what people do and what's needed within each of the ONET occupations. All right, some future plans. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an uh, evolutionary uh, process. It uh, gets updated in, in stages. It's a continuing process. And so what DOL indicates that it's going to be focusing on in the um, in the near term is um, collecting occupations or focusing on collection of, of information on occupations that are part of the uh, in-demand, high-growth area or new and emerging occupations. And again, this is to get a better handle on what's happening out there in the U.S. economy to give, give people information that they can use for, for planning purposes. And so they want to publish new data uh, at least once a year for about 100 occupations. They're going to be publishing some new interest and work value information for all of the 812 occupations this coming summer. So they're going through a process of, um, of actually um, making the procedures for those kinds of characteristics a, a little more methodical. They want to continue to update and improve the lay title database. And this is the part of uh, ONET Online and the ONET database which uh, actually provides other job titles for that occupation. So not all people in the world use the ONET occupational words in order to describe a job or an occupation. So they want to incorporate those kinds of, of uh, titles that are actually used by employers and job ads and, and so on for each of the ONET occupations so that there's a, a better understanding of what that occupation is about. And they're also going to be collecting more tools and technology information for the ONET occupation. All right, I have a, another question that I see has come in. You indicated that there are 812 occupations. Do you see an increase in that number? Um, I'm going to say that there's probably going to be a, a little increase because they are focusing on new and emerging occupations. And so those would be occupations that are not currently in uh, ONET Online or in the ONET database. Uh, there are occupations that are uh, kind of uh, becoming important in the U.S. economy, and they require uh, some better descriptors and more information so that people can actually do better career planning and better, better research and so on. So, yeah, I, I would anticipate that that number is going to increase somewhat. Uh, but then there are going to be occupations that might be um, consolidated as well. So um, it's possible that number will actually hover around uh, around 812, plus or minus uh, some number of occupations. All right. Now, I've given you some of the latest that I know about with regard to the uh, ONET system, but you can get that information. Uh, delivered to your uh, laptop or desktop just by signing up for uh, ONET updates. And so they will inform you when things have been updated. They will inform you when new information is available. And all you have to do is go to onetcenter.org and look for the section where um, they post ONET updates. And you can actually see that information on the website. And from there, you can also sign up to receive email updates. And so you can get the information uh, just as quickly as, uh, as I get it. Um, if you don't want that kind of information, uh, then you would need to go to the actual website and see what they've posted there. Uh, but you'd have to do that on your own kind of schedule. Uh, or, of course, come to one of the uh, other webinars where we attempt to keep people informed about what's happening with the ONET system. 
Now, so, um, in conclusion, uh, what I hopefully have done today is to review the basic ONET content model and to actually get a little bit into the details of that uh, content model, describing the data elements or those uh, subsections of the, the content model, and to show you how data are collected from employees, uh, focusing on those questionnaires, and talking to you about uh, how the ONET database is updated and how frequently it's updated. And I did want you to um, actually um, make sure that you were aware of the important links related to this, which is online.onetcenter.org, which is where you find ONET online. And then there's onetcenter.org, which is what I consider to be the portal for ONET, which is where you can find um, everything that's posted about the ONET system. And then onetacademy.com, where you can find information about these um, um, webinars that we do. Uh, other training opportunities, and also listen to uh, archived webinars, those that we've done in the past, and also uh, uh, find the slides that um, I've been using for these webinars. And that is generally the procedure that's, that's being used by people who do these webinars. You can hear the archived session. You can't ask questions, but you can listen to the presenter, and you can also download the related slides. So I want to stop for a moment and see if you have any uh, particular questions. I've been attempting to answer them as they have come in. Um, but uh, by all means, enter your question in the chat box, and um, I'll do my best to uh, field the questions and, and provide the answers that I can. And so I, I'll give you a moment to do that. And um, I want to tell you a little bit more information while you're doing that. We do have other webinars. And if you go to onetacademy.com, you'll see a, a long list of webinars that have been done over the last uh, several months. And there's some on the um, various ONET assessment instruments. There's ONET for the older worker, and we're actually doing that one tomorrow as well. And there's ONET for the military member in transition, ONET for the job seeker, ONET for career development professionals and school counselors, uh, one we do on linking education, occupations, and pay, and, and a few others that are out there. And again, you can see the list, and you'll get notices when we um, have more webinars that are live webinars that are being done. I also now want to take the opportunity to give you an opportunity. And uh, there are two areas where we are seeking some people who might like to um, actually highlight what they're doing with the ONET information. And so um, I have uh, on the line here uh, Bonnie Stenson, uh, who is attempting to find people who are doing creative things with ONET. And she wants to actually feature you on, um, on the website so that other people can get good ideas on how to use the ONET system. So Bonnie, if you would uh, unmute your phone and uh, talk a little bit more about what your needs are. Gary, is she able to unmute her phone? Uh, one moment, Janet, while I uh, allow her that option. Okay. Would you like your participants to be able to unmute their own lines by pressing star six? Press one for yes. All participants have been muted. You will now rejoin the conference. All right, anyone who has a question, you are now able to unmute your phone. It is star six on your phone's keypad. Okay, well, uh, I wonder, Bonnie, if you want to uh, describe your needs with regard to the spotlight. Okay, I think Bonnie must be having trouble um, unmuting her phone. Um, I'll give her a little bit of time to uh, contend with that. And I want to talk then about podcasts. Uh, we're also doing a series of podcasts kind of relating to the same issue. Uh, if there are any of you out there that, um, that are using the ONET system in a way that you find particularly helpful or unique or beneficial, uh, I'd like to be able to talk with you about that and um, possibly do a podcast for us. And, and what a podcast really is, it'll be about oh, um, six to eight minutes of time. And um, 
I will ask you a series of questions that we um, we think about ahead of time, and it's really to draw out from you uh, the kind of work that you do and uh, how you are using the ONET system and um, you know, actually getting a specific example of how you use the ONET information in the work that you do. So if any of you are interested in uh, actually doing a podcast with me, and of course the, the link to that podcast would be broadcast uh, to uh, all of the people that have an interest in ONET, and uh, they will be able to listen to the podcast and get the good ideas that you have. So if you are interested in that, uh, send me an email, and my email address is Sage Solutions, S-A-G-E, Solutions, plural, at earthlink.net. And uh, include uh, your phone number, and I'll give you a call, and we'll see where we go from there. And again, if uh, Bonnie wants to um, talk about her needs, that would be great. Okay, I guess Bonnie... Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, I can. Great. Oh, okay, wow. That took a lot of tries. Um, and I missed what you said about your podcast. I'm sorry. But um, I have an opportunity that's similar to Janet's and that we would like to um, give some ink, so to speak, on the ONET knowledge site uh, to folks who are using um, ONET in their work and... Um, if you'd like to see some examples of what it is, what it means to be spotlighted on the website, you can go to um, www.onet knowledge um, and see the spotlights where we have uh, given people a chance to tell their story about how they use Onet creatively in their work, and um, then we feature also a picture of the person. At work, and it's kind of fun, um, and it gives a, it gives your colleagues a chance to um, see your 15 minutes of fame online, and I think it gives um, people who visit the website a chance to see that there are lots of people out there using ONET in many different creative ways. You, if you go look at the profiles. Um, of people who are spotlighted. You can see there are people there in business and education and workforce development. There are people um, in schools. There are people uh, all over the country. And um, that's kind of, I think it kind of helps people get the creative juices flowing about how they um, can leverage on it in their um, work life. So um, I, I think you need to go, uh, if you go to um, ownetknowledgesite.com and see how fun um, being featured in a, a, a profile in the spotlight area and you would like to be spotlighted, you can contact me. And let me give my um, email address, Janet, if I might. It's stenson49 at hotmail.com. That's S T E N S O N 49 at hotmail.com. And um, send me a little email and say you'd like the fun of um, being spotlighted. And all that's required on your part is I would call you and um, interview you for 20 or 30 minutes. And then um, you would need to send me a digital photo of you. And um, then we can get you online. Thanks, Janet. Okay, great, Bonnie. Uh, so podcasts are available to you, and being spotlighted is available to you. And uh, while Bonnie and I were talking, I had a, another question come in, and that's uh, um, regarding the response rate that uh, our that the um, contractor gets from sending out or soliciting respondents to their questionnaires. Um, remember, it's a, a two-stage situation where first the businesses are uh, sampled. And then, then what happens is they get agreement from the businesses and from the employers, uh, from the agencies, whatever the case may be, uh, to actually utilize a subset of their people. And so there is an agreement made ahead of time that they will provide uh, employees to answer the questions that are uh, required. And so the response rate is quite high. 
Uh, I don't know that it's a hundred percent because clearly people get get sick or um, uh, do the questionnaire incorrectly or, or something along that line. But it's a very very high rate. So again, the um, information is quite good. All right. Are there any other questions that any of you have? Okay, uh, hearing none, I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that uh, you, you come to um, additional webinars that we do, and I hope I will see you spotlighted on uh, the ONET Knowledge site, and I also look forward to talking to some of you about uh, doing a, a podcast that will be broadcast to the ONET group. So uh, do send us an email, and we'll get things going with you. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day.